and peace to you in the name of Jesus, the Son of God, and God the Son, who welcomes people, all people, into his open arms. Amen. The Blackwater River meanders through a section of the Florida panhandle, making its way through cypress groves and murky, muddy swamps. For years, residents living near the Blackwater River were scared to death of it, and for a very good reason, uh, for over a period of 20 years or so, a number of prized hunting dogs had disappeared in and around the Blackwater River. One day, uh, late in August of 1995, a man named Rufus Goodwin solved the mystery. He was able to figure out why so many dogs were just disappearing into thin air. Uh, You see, Rufus Goodwin's own prized hunting dog named Flojo uh, was one of those many dogs, uh, dogs that were here today and gone tomorrow. But his dog, Flojo, had an electric collar on her, and so Rufus Goodwin was able to track her through the signal of the collar to the source where Flojo might be. And where was Flojo? Well, brace yourself. Uh, Flojo was somewhere inside of a 500-pound, 50-year-old alligator. Rufus Goodwin also figured out how this gator was uh, getting these prized hunting dogs. Uh, The gator would would crawl out of one of these swamps uh, late at night, position itself along one of the paths, and as these dogs ran along the path, uh, the gator would have its jaws wide open, and these dogs, uh, uh, unable to see because of the darkness, would run right into these gators' gaping jaws for uh, what I'm sure would be a great late-night snack or the alligator. Uh, We begin this weekend with this very brief sermon series on the book of Deuteronomy, uh, Moses' final book. Uh, In this year of Moses here at Our Savior Lutheran Church, we have looked at, at the New Testament book of Hebrews, and Hebrews primed us for the study of the books of Moses. From Hebrews, we went headlong into Exodus and then into Leviticus. This summer, we traveled with the Israelites through the wilderness in the book of Numbers. And, of course, after Numbers comes Moses' fifth and final book, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is a call to remember. Your your bulletin cover kind of gives you a, a good picture of the book itself. Uh, You see there on the cover the mighty man Moses. He's up there on the plains of Moab and he is holding the Ten Commandments and Moses is telling uh, these people. He's telling God's people. He's telling the Israelites. uh, In the latter part of the 15th century BC as they stand there on the plains of Moab, Moses is telling them to remember. Remember. Remember what? Well, remember God's promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember that God delivered you out of slavery in Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Remember God gave you the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, the tabernacle, His very presence among you. Remember how how that 11-day journey turned into 40 years. And remember how God provided for you during those 40 years with manna and quail and water from a rock. And the list of what Moses wants these people to remember goes on and on and on for 33 chapters. Deuteronomy is just a really long sermon as Israel gets ready to enter into the promised land. If you were in Bible study, you know what happens to Moses after he preaches this very long sermon. Uh, He goes up Mount Nebo and he dies. Remember that. And you've got to help me remember that as well. The longer the sermon, the closer you get, Pastor Shoddy, to death. (laughs) But that's what happens uh, to Moses in the last chapter, chapter 34, Moses dies. Today we're in chapter 6 of Deuteronomy, and Moses, as he's preaching to these people on the plains of Moab, uh, getting ready to enter into the promised land, Moses says, remember God's plan. Don't forget God's plan. Uh, God has a plan. God has a plan for what? 
Well, God has a plan for families. God loves families. God cherishes families. God delights in families, and God has a plan for families, and we need it. We need God's plan for our family. Why is that? You might be asking. Well, there's another kind of alligator out there that is taking children's lives and having them for a late night snack. This alligator of sorts goes by any number of different names, but for the sake of our sermon this morning, I'm going to use this. Secular American culture. Secular American culture. Everybody got that? Secular American culture positions itself so that it can chew up and spit our children out. And the results are right in front of us. Secular American culture is destroying children's sexuality. It's destroying their dreams. It's destroying their ambitions. It's destroying their identity. And it seeks to destroy their lives. Secular American culture, like a ravenous alligator, is chewing up their lives and spitting them out. And Moses has something to say about that. And this is how it begins in chapter 6 of Deuteronomy. Remember, Moses is preaching on the plains of Moab, and he begins this way. This is the command. Uh, now, I have that phrase highlighted for you because the command uh, that he's talking about is, is the most important command in the Old Testament. Uh, in fact, uh, the command is actually a prayer that Jews will pray twice daily. And you know it. It's Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Uh, Shema Yisrael. Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Achad. That's the Hebrew. Uh, here's a translation. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. And you might be thinking, that's not how it goes, Pastor. That's not how I memorized that verse. I memorized it like this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And, and that's okay, but akkad in Hebrew in this context means alone. So it's, it's a rallying cry. Uh, we don't worship any other gods. Yahweh alone. It's reiterating the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Akkad. That's the command. Everything else flows out of that. Like, as Moses says, decrees and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. You must listen to them in the land you are about to enter. The land you are about to enter. Well, that's the promised land, right? And this promised land is not a, a neutral land. This is a land that is dominated by secular Canaanite culture. And what does that look like? Well, in Canaan, um, as in Israel today, if you're a farmer, uh, the key, of course, is rain. But there's always, always a problem with water uh, in the promised land. So as God's people are getting ready, ready to enter into this land, they're going to be farmers. And if you're a farmer, you're always going to be talking about rain. I mean, we all know farmers, right? Uh, they're always talking about rain. There's either too little or there's too much. It, it came at the wrong time and it fell in the wrong place. Uh, farmers are always talking about rain. So the question is this, if you're a farmer uh, in Canaan, how do you get it to rain? Well, this is where secular Canaanite culture comes into play. Now what I'm about to say is, is a mythology. Uh, it's not real, uh, but the Canaanites believed it to be true. So in order to influence the gods uh, to make it rain, uh, the farmer would find a temple prostitute, a woman of the night, and he would have sexual relations with her. And then these Canaanite gods named Baal and Asherah uh, in the mythology, well, they too would sleep together, and guess what? Presto, rain. Here's the idea. Canaanite secular culture deifies, uh, makes God, makes sexuality and makes money God alone. Is there anything wrong with 
Sexuality and money? No, not at all. These are God's great gifts to us, but when they become ultimate, when I deify sexuality and money, well, that'll destroy me, and that'll destroy my family. This is the land that these people are going into, a land where sexuality and riches are God. No wonder Moses says, Shema, listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord Akkad, alone. Not these Canaanite gods. Uh, these gods will promise you everything, but in the end, they deliver you absolutely nothing. This land that we live in, the United States of America, it's a good land, it's a beautiful land, liberty and justice for all, but we too need to understand that it's got a, a secular side, uh, right? And the secular side of the United States of America uh, deifies sexuality and money. Our secular American culture is driven along by, by books like uh, The Nurture Assumption by Judith Rich Harris. And Judith Rich Harris, in her, in her book, The Nurture Assumption, says, uh, she says that parents have little or no impact on their children. Parents are essentially non-players in their children's lives. Parents are, are simply bystanders. So parents, you can just chill out, I guess, take a break. Uh, it doesn't matter what you do, according to Judith Rich Harris. So here we are, uh, secular American culture tries to rob parents and grandparents and the family of their God-given responsibilities. Just let the culture raise your children. In the great debate between nurture and nature, Judith Rich Harris concludes, uh, forget nurture. Forget the nurturing environment of family. It doesn't matter. It has little or no impact on your children. Well, Moses has a few things to say about that. Moses pushes back hard against that, not only against Canaanite secular culture, but also against American secular culture because God has a plan. He's got a plan for families, and it's nothing like uh, Judith Rich Harris's book. And what's that plan? Well, it begins in verse 6 of chapter 6. God's plan begins with radical belief. Radical belief. Belief. Now, by radical, and you're going to hear that word several times this morning, radical means it's not business as usual. Radical means that we have a fight on our hands. Radical means revolutionary. Radical uh, means it's time to do something subversive. Radical. In this land that we live in, we need radical belief. Not, not belief is normal. No, no, no. We're, we're going to up it a notch. Radical belief. This is what Moses says on the plains of Moab. He says, These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. So he's talking to parents. He's talking to grandparents. Anyone who deals with children. If these commandments... This Word of God is not on my heart. If I don't love the Word of God, if I'm not emotionally connected uh, to God's Word, forget it. If my Christianity is just a religion and not a relationship, well, then I'll have nothing eternal to give to my children. So it all starts with us, with parents, with grandparents. God's commandments are on our hearts then I'm in a position to impress them. And the Hebrew word there simply means uh, to repeat over and over again. I impress them upon who? Well, that would be the children who are entering this land that chews them up and spits them out. And the only way we're going to make it in this land is radical belief. So parents, uh, grandparents, what do you teach your children? You teach your children about movies, about the internet, about social media, about friends, about money. What do you teach your children, your grandchildren about Jesus, about the Bible, about Sunday school, about worship? What do you teach your children about prayer? Now, am I advocating some 21st century legalistic view 
of Christianity. No, I'm not. I mean, I, I get it, folks. Jesus had his harshest words for, for religious people who would just boil it all down to a list of do's and don'ts. But, but I'm afraid that by not following God's plan for families, God's word on our hearts and impressing them upon our children by doing that, uh, then we end up sacrificing a generation of children on the altar of, of so-called Christian freedom, which is nothing more than unbridled conformity to secular American culture. We need radical belief. Moses goes on, uh, once it's on my heart and I impress them upon my children, well then how does that play out? Well, it plays out in radical teaching. Moses says, talk about them. That, that's God's words, uh, God's words of, of delight, His words of joy, God's words of wisdom and direction. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Now, that sounds like, well, just about all the time, right? Uh, that's radical. This man named uh, Jim Rifle. Jim Rifle is a believer in Jesus. Jim Rifle lives in Fort Worth uh, with his wife, Linda, and his two sons, Travis and Hunter. Uh, Jim Rifle is the founder and president of Woodcrest Capital. His, his business owns and operates any number of shopping centers throughout the Dallas-Fort Worth metroplex. A few years ago, uh, a business defaulted on its lease in one of Jim Rifle's uh, numerous shopping centers. Uh, the businessman simply just kind of vacated the store, a video store, snuck out in the middle of the night. Well, Jim Rifle uh, took the man to court and he won uh, a settlement. Uh, Jim Rifle was awarded $100,000, but there was a catch. The $100,000 came in the form of 4,000 hardcore pornography DVDs. So what did Jim Rifle do? Better yet, what would you do? What would I do? I mean, I'm a dad. I'm actually a granddad now. Uh, what do I do when I'm faced with, with a moral choice between filth and, and faith, uh, between honesty and lies, between humility and pride, between uh, generosity and stinginess? What do I do w when I'm faced with, with worship or with skipping out? Well, Jim Rifle knew exactly what he was going to do. He, he went out and he rented a 13-ton steamroller. He took those 4,000 DVDs, stacked them up in a parking lot. He put his two sons, Travis and Hunter, in the cab of that steamroller. He revved the engine up, and Jim Rifle made black soup of shattered plastic out of those DVDs. So there's a group of people out there watching, and there were several reporters, and they asked, well, what's up? What are you doing? And Jim Rifle said, pornography devastates people. Pornography must be destroyed. Now, do you, do you suppose his two sons, Travis and Hunter, are going to remember that day? Uh, that day when, when dad rented this big, huge, yellow machine. Uh, that day that, that dad took a moral stand. That day that dad lost $100,000. Do you suppose they're going to remember that day? Yeah. Bet they will. They're going to remember that day. What will our children and grandchildren remember us by? What acts of moral courage do we take? It's radical belief here with my lips and with my life. Moses goes on if you're going to survive as a family, in this promised land with decadent Canaanite religion, you not only need radical belief and radical teaching, you need radical study. Radical study, radical revolutionary. Moses says, tie them. That's the word of God. Tie God's words uh, to your hands. Wear them on your foreheads as reminders. And many Jews uh, still do this today. They're called phylacteries, or, uh, small leather boxes made out of the skins of kosher animals and, and they put inside this box Deuteronomy 6 verses 4 to 9 in these little boxes and they tie these boxes uh, to their foreheads and on their arms with a leather strap. There's more. Moses goes on. He says, write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. If you go anywhere in Israel, you'll find uh, these things. They're, they're called mezuzahs. 
A mezuzah is a small decorative box which contains, again, uh, the words from Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9, and also add some words from Deuteronomy 11, 13 to 21. The mezuzah uh, is attached to the, the upper right side of the doorway. It, it, you might have noticed if you go into my office, the doorway, uh, you'll find this attached to the upper right side. It, this is a mezuzah, a small one. I, it was there when I got here, so I left it there. Uh, but inside, a uh, little scroll uh, with the words of Deuteronomy 6 printed on it. That's radical. That, that's getting God's Word in my head, uh, on, my, on my body. Uh, the Word of God informs my home. A Latin poet Virgil, along about 30 B.C., said, As the twig is bent, the tree inclines. Alexander Pope, uh, in the 18th century, he said it better. Uh, it makes it a little bit more clear to me. He said, as a twig is bent, so grows the tree. So the question is, what is it that's bending our children, our grandchildren, the children of this church? God would have radical study of his word right on my head, my hands, right on the doorframe of my home. Moses has one more piece, and it's the most important piece because kids mess up, right? Uh, kids make bad decisions, don't they? So do adults. The only way we're going to survive in this land is with radical gospel. Not just humdrum gospel or status quo gospel or inoffensive gospel. No, radical, revolutionary gospel. Look how revolutionary this is. Moses goes on in verse 10, The Lord your God will bring you. God does the bringing. God does the bringing. We're just passive. We'll bring you into the land he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give. That, that word give, uh, connected to land, appears 130 times in the book of Deuteronomy. The God that we are worshiping today is abundantly generous and giving. Our cups overflow. He gives and gives and gives some more. And there's more. There's always more in the gospel. When you get in the land, you're going to have large, flourishing cities you did not build. Houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide. Wells you did not dig. And vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. You get it? God does it all. Radical good news of this giving, generous God of ours. And this radical gospel actually has flesh and blood, doesn't it? We see this radical gospel in the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God brings us, uh, you and me, not into the promised land, but He brings us to Jesus in the power of the Spirit. There's, but there's more than just this coming to Jesus. There's, there's always more in the gospel. God fills us with the Holy Spirit that, that we don't send. Uh, God gives us sisters and brothers in Christ that, that we don't create. God gives us the means of grace, holy baptism and holy communion that we don't deserve. Uh, God gives us the Bible that we don't write. God gives us life now and eternally that we don't earn. God does it all. And he does it all in the name of Jesus. Jesus crucified for you. There's this young man uh, named Michael. Michael lives in Tampa, Florida a few years ago. Uh, when Michael was just 12 years old, uh, he was swimming uh, in this pond out behind, out behind his home in Tampa, Florida. He had on a snorkel and a mask, and he was having time of his life swimming around in this pond. Now, little did Michael know that there was a 400-pound alligator uh, getting ready to destroy him. Uh, the gator snuck up on Michael and clamped his jaws down on Michael's head, taking his snorkel and his mask off. Now, miraculously, Michael was able to pull away out of that alive, but the gator kept coming after him. So what did Michael do after that? Well, he screamed. For who? He screamed for mom. 
And mom came running, and she grabbed a hold of, of Michael's arms. Uh, the gator had a hold of Michael's legs, and there was this fierce tug of war between a tenacious mother and a ferocious alligator, when all of a sudden, without reason, the alligator gave up. Uh, three months later, Michael brought his friends down to the pond, this place uh, where he was miraculously uh, delivered from. And he also showed his friends these three uh, massive scars uh, on his right forearm, stretching from his wrist uh, to his elbow. These scars that would be with him for the rest of his life. Scars left not by the alligator. Scars left by mom. Like Michael, children are engaged in a fierce battle with secular American culture. And so it's time to get radical. It can't be business as usual. It's radical belief on our hearts so that we can impress that upon our children and grandchildren. It's radical revolutionary, radical belief. Radical teaching with my lips and my life. Who knows, I may have to go out and rent a 13-ton steamroller. It's radical study, right? Mezuzahs, phylacteries, the Word of God around us. It's radical gospel in the name of Jesus. So in this fierce tug of war, with this alligator of secular American culture, we keep pulling. I don't care how old our children are, we keep pulling, we keep praying, we keep pulling them, and we're going to pull them all the days of our lives, and we're going to pull them where? We're going to pull them into the open arms of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and sing, shall we?